O my Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O my Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all pervading personality of Godhead. Oh, for my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. And the primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is, is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. I therefore meditate upon him. Uh, I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in a transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitro Votra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Sivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Purir Ishwaraha Sajurhidi Avarudya Tetra Kriti bihi susu subhistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam sukhamukad amrita dravya samyutam pibata Bhagavatam rasam alayam Mohor aho raska bhuvibhavu kaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although this nectarine juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana 
Vidyantak Slobhadrani Vidunati Suhitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. Is it uh, is is it self righteous activity? And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta preesu badresu. Vit Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhavo kama loba dayaschaye chete tara navidam stitvam sadpe prasidati By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangha sijayate. When these purities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya shiyante chashikarmani drista evat manishwari Thus, bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of samsayam samagram, understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, verse number 11. You know, Jugopa. What? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's 12. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yatejasata Bhagavan Yudhi Sulapanair. Vishma Pitasa Girijo. Stramadan Nijamme Anye Pichaham Amunaiva Kale Varena Anye Pichaham Amunaiva Kale Varena Prabto Mahendra Bhavane Mahad Asanardam Translation, it was by his influence only that in a fight I was able to astonish the personality of God, Lord Shiva, and his wife, the daughter of Mount Himalaya. Thus he, Lord Shiva, became pleased with me and awarded me his own weapon. Other demigods also delivered their respective weapons to me. In addition, I was able to reach the heavenly planets in the present body and was allowed a half elevated seat. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. 
By the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, all the demigods, including Lord Shiva, were pleased with Arjuna. The idea is that one who is favored by Lord Shiva or any other demigod may not necessarily be favored by the Supreme Sri Krishna. Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. Ravana was certainly a great devotee of Lord Shiva, but he could not be saved from the wrath of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ramachandra. And there are many instances like that in the histories of the Puranas. But here is an instance where we can see that Lord Shiva became pleased even in a fight with Arjuna. The devotees of the Supreme Lord know how to respect the demigods. But the devotees of the demigods sometimes foolishly think that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is no greater than the demigods. By such a conception, one becomes an offender and ultimately meets with the same end as Ravana and others. The instances described by Arjuna during his friendly dealings with Lord Sri Krishna are instructive for all who may be convinced by the lessons that one can achieve all favors simply by pleasing the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. Whereas the devotees or worshippers of the demigods may achieve only partial benefits, which are also perishable, just as the demigods themselves. Another significance of the present verse is that Arjuna, by the grace of Lord Sri Krishna, was able to reach the heavenly planet even with the self-same body and was honored by the heavenly demigod Indradeva being seated with him half elevated. One can reach the heavenly planets by the pious acts recommended in the Shastras in the category of fruitive activities. And as stated in the Bhagavad Gita 921, when the reactions of such pious acts are spent, the enjoyer is again degraded to this earthly planet. The moon is also on the level with the heavenly planets and only persons who have performed virtues only performing sacrifices, giving charity, undergoing severe austerities can be allowed to enter into the heavenly planets after the duration of life of the body. Arjuna was al allowed to enter into the heavenly planets in the self-same body simply by the grace of the Lord, otherwise it is not possible to do so. The present attempts to enter into the heavenly planets by the modern scientists will certainly prove futile because such scientists are not on the level of Arjuna. They are ordinary human beings without any assets of sacrifice, charity, or austerities. The material body is influenced by the three modes of material nature, namely goodness, passion, and ignorance. The present population are more or less is, is more or less influenced by the modes of passion and ignorance, and the symptoms for such an influence are exhibited in their becoming very lusty and greedy. Such degraded fellows can hardly approach the higher planetary systems. Above the heavenly planets, there are many other planets also, which only those who are influenced by goodness can reach. In heavenly and other planets within the universe, the inhabitants are all highly intelligent, many, many more times than human beings, and they're all pious in the higher and highest mode of goodness. They are all devotees of the Lord, and although their goodness is not unadulterated, meaning it is adulterated somewhat, still they are known as demigods, possessing the maximum amount of good qualities possible within the material world. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <clears throat> now we see here what's it's called the uh, analysis. Not only is Prabhupada explaining pastimes of the Lord, but he's analyzing that from the point of view of pure Krishna consciousness. That's what a acharya does. They give you not just stories, but they give you insightful realizations to take away from the stories. And that's called self-realization. So we see that although one may worship Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva is considered Vaishnavanam, Yata Vishnu, the greatest Vaishnava. And one reason why is because he is, 
he accepts all those disciples who other gurus reject because they're too fallen, like Buddhas and Pisachas and uh, other types of uh, low-class people. But Lord Shiva is very merciful and he tries to help them. However, someone who worships Lord Shiva and thinks he is God uh, is in for a surprise because Ravana was a great devotee of Lord Shiva, very, very big time devotee of Lord Shiva. And even though Lord Shiva, in a sense, was on his side, uh, he was defeated. And also, uh, uh, the demon had, had a thousand arms. Um, anyway, there's another demon. He was a great worshiper of Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva actually fought on his side. But Krishna threw a yawning wep weapon at him, and uh, yeah, Banasura, and uh, he. Uh, he started yawning and got sleepy and went off the battlefield. And then Krishna defeated Banasura with his, who had a thousand arms. <clears throat> so he could shoot at least 500 arrows at one time. So we see there are many examples of people who worship Lord Shiva thinking he's the supreme personality of Godhead. And later on, they were, even though Lord Shiva was on their side, they were defeated by Krishna. So, therefore, although Ravana was a big devotee of Lord Shiva, Lord Ramachandra defeated him. And so there are many histories in the Puranas like this. But here we see that although Arjuna gets the favor of Lord Shiva uh, in, in a fight, in other words, Lord Shiva it seemed as if Arjuna was not able, it was Lord, fought in such a valiant way that Lord Shiva was not able to defeat him. So Lord Shiva gave him his benediction. So here, here's the main point that Prabhupada makes. He says, the, the devotees of the Supreme Lord, Krishna, know how to respect the demigods, but the devotees of the demigods sometimes foolishly think that the Supreme Personality God is no greater than a demigod, than the demigods. So, Here's a point that we should all be very careful about, and that is we should never disrespect the demigods. Even though there's so much information about Krishna's supremacy in the Bhagavad Gita, like for example, it says that anyone who worships the demigods is less intelligent. Well, does that mean that we should insult people who are less intelligent? No. Does that mean we should insult the demigods? No. So we have to be very careful about how we act as Vaishnavas. Vaishnavas respect even an ant. So why should they not respect the demigods? Why should they not respect the worshippers of the demigods? But they will not uh, participate in worshiping Lord Shiva as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but they worship him as the greatest Vaishnava. This is 9th chapter 21st. Those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, surrender unto demigods, and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. Yeah, so people who are in the modes of passion and ignorance, they sometimes take to the worship of demigods. Yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shodayar chitam ichati tasya tasya shalam shradham tam eva vidam yaham. And uh, Krishna says, I'm in everyone's heart as a super soul. And as soon as one desires to worship some demigod, I make his faith steady so that he can devote himself to that particular deity. Now, why would Krishna do that? Well, it's because man proposes, God disposes. So somebody 
thinks, oh, if I go to Krishna, he won't give me what I want. I want to smoke ganja. I want to engage in some uh, fun activities like smoking marijuana or eating meat. So I won't go to Krishna. I'll go to Lord Shiva or Mother Durga. So as soon as one desires to worship some demigod, Krishna makes that person's faith steady so that he can devote himself to that particular duty. <clears throat> so that's a sign that Krishna does not interfere with our limited free will. Uh, if a person desires material enjoyment and wants sincerely to have such facilities from the material uh, demigods, then Krishna, as super soul in everyone's heart, understands those desires and gives facilities to such persons. So now what do we understand from this? We should be very careful about what we desire. The whole purpose of Krishna consciousness is to stop desiring material sense gratification and to start desiring pleasing Lord Krishna's senses. That's the whole purpose of RT ceremony. That's the whole purpose of the deity worship where we're trying to please Krishna's senses by offering nice scented incense and offering a ghee wick and offering uh, uh, nice water and offering flowers and offering garlands and so forth. All those things are meant for pleasing Krishna. But if we want to please ourselves and we hear that the demigods will give us material pleasures, then Krishna fixes our determination to worship the demigods. So then it says, Prabhupada says, so uh, some may ask why the all-powerful God gives facilities to the living entities for enjoying this material world and so lets them fall into the trap of the illusory energy. And that's an important question. The answer is that if the Supreme Lord as super soul does not give such facilities, then there's no meaning to independence. So that's the problem with independence. You can independently desire something bad or you can independently desire something good. And if you don't know the difference between those two, then you usually desire something bad thinking it's good. That's called ignorance and illusion. So <laughs> one in Prabhupada writes, so people think that sex life is good. Actually, it's horrible but only because they're in Maya do they think it's good. So when we hear these things, uh, it's a little shocking because the whole world glorifies sense gratification. The educational system glorifies sense gratification. Uh, the whole scientific community glorifies sense gratification. Many philosophers glorify sense gratification. In fact, they write big, long books about how to increase your sense gratification. So in such an atmosphere, to, it's not surprising that, that people uh, end up worshiping demigods. Or they worship someone who thinks, like a politician who promises them more sense gratification, they think that person is gonna be their choice to vote for. What do politicians do? They, they promise sense gratification more economic development, more this, more that. So people who are in ignorance, they become bewildered by such things. And Krishna says, uh, as super soul, uh, he uh, will help them satisfy their desires. Therefore, he gives everyone full independence, whatever one likes, but his ultimate instruction we find in the Bhagavad Gita, one should give up all other engagements and fully surrender unto him. That will make a person happy. So this is one reason why people get initiated, because uh, they begin to understand that they're not gonna be happy by engaging in different types of sense gratification although everyone's trying to convince them to do that. Right? Like uh, someone's family will say, well, you, sh you don't have to wake up so early, you know, you, you need your sleep. And they'll say what, that, you know, and, and sex is a normal thing. You, you know, these, these devotees, they try to make it out as some bad thing. 
and uh, you should save your money. Don't give so much money to the temple. And they'll go right down the line. No, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, basically, don't engage in devotional service, don't take initiation, don't, don't, don't follow all these rules and regulations. You've got to be a normal person. What they don't understand is their normal is abnormal. That's what they don't understand. They want to make it normal in diff by, by, by making statements, but a statement doesn't make something normal. Uh, there, therefore, uh, the again the uh, when the nutshell one of the nutshell verses of the Bhagavatam is it should be what we judge things from, and that verse says anything that seems real that is not related to Krishna is unreal. So, so that's an important verse. So whatever they say, they think this is the reality. If if it's not related to pleasing Krishna, it's actually not true. So, therefore, it says, uh, when people are endowed with such faith that Krishna helps them develop in the demigod, they worship a particular demigod and obtain their desires. See, it's not that the demigods don't give these desires, that's what they do. They satisfy those material desires. But in actuality, these benefits are bestowed by me alone. So, in other words, even having the, the blessing of having sense gratification, so-called blessing, actually, it's a curse, but that also comes from Krishna. The demigods themselves cannot give anything. They're only supply agents, just like the uh, Amazon Prime delivery man. He's not giving, he, he doesn't own those uh, gifts that you're, you're purchasing, right? He's simply delivering it. So that's the position of the demigods. They're just delivery agents. They're like Amazon Prime drivers. They come to your house and deliver a box to you. But they have to get it from Krishna because everything comes from Krishna. So therefore, Prabhupada says, the demigods cannot award benedictions to their devotees without the permission of the Supreme Lord. The living entity may forget that everything is the property of the Supreme Lord, but the demigods do not forget so the worship of demigods and achievement of desired results are due not to the demigods, but to the Supreme Personality of Godhead by arrangement. The less intelligent living entity does not know this, and therefore he foolishly goes to the demigods for some benefit. So one time there was this Indian farmer, and one day Akbar, King Akbar, got lost on a hunting trip in Rajasthan, and he got separated from the other people, and the, you know, the soldiers and other people that were accompanying him. And Rajasthan, of course, is very hot. Uh, and he became very thirsty, and he became a little worried, too, because he didn't know where the others were. They didn't know where he was. But he comes across this farmer in this very, almost desert-like place in Rajasthan, and he asks him for some water. And the farmer gives it to him. And then he says, do you know who, you, who I am? And the farmer says, no, I don't know who you are. He says, I am Akbar. I am the emperor of India. He said, I'm glad to meet you. Haribo. And, uh, and Akbar says, look, you, you've been very kind to me. You gave me some water. I'm very thirsty. You gave me some food. If you ever have any problem, you come and see me in uh, Delhi. So the farmer said, okay. So time went on. Uh, there was a very severe drought in Rajasthan. And crops failed. And the farmer said, okay, well, this big guy, he told me I could go and see him. So he goes to Delhi to see Akbar. And when he gets there, he tries to get in the palace. They won't let him in. And he gets upset. And he said, tell him it's, I'm the farmer that gave him water in Rajasthan. So they tell Akbar that. Akbar says, let him in. So he, 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 he gets to the private uh, residence of Akbar in the big palace, the, the Red Fort, right, in Delhi. And uh, Akbar is doing his uh, midday prayers, his, his namaz. And he's praying, you know, Allah Akbar. And then he goes down and he opens his hands like this. And he said, please, my Lord, 
please Allah, uh, let my armies be victorious. Let my enemies all die. Let their wives have abortions and give me wealth, give me strength. And like that, he's praying. So the, the, the farmer's hearing him. So when Akbar finishes, he comes and sees, he said, oh, my dear friend, you've come to see me, huh? I heard there's a big drought in Rajasthan. So what do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. And the farmer said, well, sir, he said, I thought I wanted something from you. And I'm coming here like a beggar. But now I see that you're also a beggar. You're begging all these things from Allah. So why should I ask you for something? I'll just ask God myself. And he leaves. So that's the whole point. <laughs> Everything is coming from Krishna. It's the demigods are not individual gods on the same level of Krishna. So you don't have to go to the demigods even to get material benedictions. It's better you go to Krishna even if you want material benedictions. And Krishna will give you uh, certain things that may help you in Krishna consciousness. But he won't give you those things that will destroy your Krishna consciousness. So, therefore, antavatu falam te sam tad bhavati alpa made sam devan devo yajo yanti mad bhakta yanti mam api. Men of soul intelligence worship the demigods, and their fruits are limited and temporary. So that's the whole point. Whatever benedictions we get from the demigods are not going to last forever because the demigods don't last forever themselves. So they can only give us certain things that are time sensitive. So uh, that so therefore Prabhupada says that uh, What Arjuna describes during his friendly dealings with Lord Sri Krishna are instructive for all who may be convinced by the lessons that one can achieve all favors simply by pleasing the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. Whereas the devotees or worshippers of the demigods may achieve only partial benefits, which are also perishable, just as the demigods themselves. So if you want temporary things, you're going to get them and you're going to lose them. Like the body also, you go to the demigods. You want something that's eternal, you come to Krishna. He might give you some temporary things just to placate your desires or our desires. But w along with what he gives, he'll, he'll also give you uh, knowledge by which you can come to him. So therefore, worshiping Krishna, even if it's for a material purpose, is much better than worshiping the demigods for material purposes. But however, worshiping Krishna for material purposes is not pure devotional service. But in the association of devotees, those impurities will be purified over time. And then you'll understand, or we'll understand, what is the real benefit of Krishna consciousness. OK, we'll stop right there. We'll go to Srila Prabhupada. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Well, the demigods themselves are somewhat in illusion. Because, like for example, Brahma. Brahma is the best devotee in the whole universe. But he still has a latent desire to dominate. Therefore, he doesn't go back to Godhead. But he's given a chance to dominate the whole universe, but do it on behalf of Krishna and offer the result to Krishna, then he becomes purified and he goes back to Godhead. So, therefore, all the demigods, from Brahma down to the, I mean, you know, there's 330 million demigods. 
330 million demigods. And, uh, or, uh, yes, yes, 333 million, like one third of a, of a billion demigods. And they're all different grades of them. You know, Brahma's the top and he go all the way down to the bottom. They all have some material desires that they want to satisfy themselves. So as long as there's even a little hint of a material desire, one cannot get out of the material world. But in general, they're in the mode of goodness. And, but their, good, their mode of goodness is still slightly contaminated. Therefore, they can purify that, but it's, I would say in one, well, Prabhupada also said it, it's the, the sense pleasure is so great on the heavenly planets that one becomes attached to it. Whereas on the earth, it's mixed. You have some sense gratification, you have some suffering. So being on the earthly planet here is more auspicious for spiritual, uh, let's say, advancement than being on the heavenly planets. Although the heavenly planets are in the mode of goodness, but one can become attached to the mode of goodness and all the material facilities that are provided with it. Whereas in the material world, it's mixed. There's a period of happiness, just like before the coronavirus or the Chinese virus, uh, people were doing pretty well economically, right? But all of a sudden, this virus comes out of nowhere and now they're suffering and they don't know what's gonna happen. Not everyone's suffering, but most people are suffering. So you see, it's that up and down uh, pattern in the material world, especially in the middle planets, that therefore it's more conducive to becoming serious about Krishna consciousness. Whereas on the heavenly planets, it's continual. Everything is good. So you, people become attached to it. Now, as long as there's one material attachment, one, everything is tainted by it. All the decisions you make, all the desires you have will be tainted by it. So in a sense, it's more difficult on the heavenly planets to go back to Godhead than it is on the earth. I was uh, considering logically that because the demigods, they still have material desires. Yes. So one of those, uh, one of these desires is uh, uh, being worshipped. they want to be worshipped, Patishta, right? Yes. Is uh, to be... Well, uh, l let's not go there. Let's not begin to uh, make up theories. We, what we know, and Prabhupada explains it here, he says, uh, he says that when the reactions, so, w Another significance of the present verse is that Arjuna, by the grace of Lord Sri Krishna, was able to reach the heavenly planets even with the self-same body and was honored by the heavenly demigod Indradeva, being seated with him, half elevated. One can reach the heavenly planets by the pious acts recommended in the Shastras in the category of fruitive activities. And as stated in Bhagavad Gita 921, when the reactions of such pious acts are spent, the enjoyer is again degraded to this earthly planet. So, uh, therefore, Krishna is telling Arjuna, rise above the Vedas. The Vedas are dealing with the three modes of material nature. He said, and don't be attached to, uh, to uh, gain and safety, or yoga and shema. Uh, just surrender unto me. So the demigods are surrendered mostly to Krishna, but they still have an attachment for a high grade of uh, sense gratification. And they're conditioned by it. The mode of goodness is also a conditioning mode. So as long as there's one desire, one, a, a person, every decision they make is gonna be slightly tainted with self-interest. Whereas the devotee, na danam, na janam, na sundarim, has no material desire at all, not even liberation. See. So demigods are on a very high level, 
but they're still tainted with some material desires. So it says that uh, the present attempts to enter the heavenly planets by the modern scientists will certainly prove futile because such scientists are not on the level of Arjuna. What was Arjuna's level? He's a devotee of Krishna. Right? And he respects all living entities, including the demigods. So therefore, Krishna gave him this incredible power to be able to fight with Lord Shiva and not lose the fight. He didn't win it either. It was, it was a draw. And Lord Shiva appreciated it and so gave him his blessings. So that's respect of the demigods. Right? Uh, he didn't disrespect Lord Shiva, even though he fought with him. He didn't disrespect him. So that, that is the difference between a devotee and a materialist who will go to the demigods for material benefits to enjoy them, and uh, they give a certain amount of respect, but respect is self-interested. Where Arjuna, he, was, he was, had no other interest than to please Krishna. So it says, in heavenly and other planets within the universe, the inhabitants are all highly intelligent, many more times than the human beings, and they are all pious in the higher and highest and highest mode of goodness. They are all devotees to the Lord, although their goodness is not unadulterated. That means they're still in this not unadulterated is a double negative, meaning it's the opposite of what it's saying. So it means that they are adulterated. Still, they are known as demigods, possessing the maximum amount of good qualities possible within the material world. So they're not Sudha Sattva, they're just Sattva. And therefore, Prabhupada says they are not unadulterated. So there's two negatives, they cancel each other. It means they are adulterated still. They are contaminated still with some material desires. Okay? So therefore, uh, their function, their, but they have a function. Their function is to be a conduit between Krishna and ordinary living entities who have some free will. And they, the ones that misuse their free will, they, uh, they give them material blessings that they receive from Krishna. So they're just delivery men. They're not independent gods in themselves. Hari Bol is the program. Yeah, they're not independent. But people who are 